in the interest of time, we'll, we'll get started. Um, now, this is, the idea of this is informal, so questions along the way, by all means. Some of the, what I'll be talking about, is being just a little bit technical um, in relation to all the new super changes that are coming through. So, by all means, if I sort of lose you along the way, that will take a few minutes and I'll be back to a bit more. So, firstly, my name is Brett Griffiths. I look after our self-managed generation area here at Vincent. Uh, and um, Ben Gordon will also be doing a, a little piece on defined benefit valuations when it comes to uh, matrimonial matters. So that's what we're going to be covering today. So as you can see, there's a fair bit there. Um, because the reality is with super, there's a fair bit involved with it. And at, regardless of when you're dealing with uh, matrimonial matters, superannuation is essentially the second biggest asset that normally a couple will have. So to consider it properly is really important. And there's a couple of things that I'm, I'm going through about the basics of super that may be relevant to when you actually you know, um, talk about that, uh, the orders of the time. So essentially for myself, um, I've been doing super for almost 20 years. Um, that was, how does that end? Um, that you first that. <laughs> That's just last week, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing what the caricatures can do these days. Um, and I've seen most things. I've never started seeing everything. For the simple fact that there's always something different that pops up, uh, particularly around um, investments and the structures around things. Because I have been doing this for as long as I have, I've actually been lucky enough to be part of nearly every major change in the that happened inside super, apart from the introduction of actual legislation back in 83, 84. So um, I've yeah, been part of part of most of it, which is really handy because everything about super is about transition. Grandfather, transitional rule, it's never about changing everything for everyone. It's about aligning the sand and moving forward. So being part of it means you actually understand all the backstory. So that's usually very helpful. So basically what we're looking at here is how we can help you, so why we're here today is really to, to help you get an understanding for you and your clients about what, how you can structure orders in relation to superannuation matters. So it's all about really the increasing that awareness about the complexity around super and, and the tax aspects of inside super. Uh, and then really it's about having a level of understanding so you know to stop and ask the question rather than perhaps just proceeding through not understanding or not appreciating what's really involved in something. So that's really what this is about this morning. So a bit of a general overview first. Superannuation is for retirement savings. Right? That's the, they call it the sole purpose. There's actually a section in the Act that says the sole purpose is for retirement savings or death benefits, which you can only use once, obviously. Now, <laughs> providing adequate income so really, the, and what we mean by retirement savings is providing an adequate income when you stop working. That's the long and the short of it. And the objective of super, which is actually something that they're just codifying now, just putting into legislation, uh, is this notion of relieving pressure on the age pension. Now, initially, when it came, when it was proposed, you know, back in 93, when they introduced legislation, it was to replace the age pension. This would be the essentially the golden goose that would save the Australian, the future Australian people from this wave of base boomers coming through for their retirement savings. Well we've now realised that the golden goose is too big to ignore and they've they've changed their ethos essentially. So it is all about relieving the pressure. So it's not about replacing, it's about well let's just make it not as burdensome. And obviously to increase the nation's savings. Now, that's essentially that's a big thing because right now what we have inside super is about two point two trillion dollars. That's broken up into a, different, a few different segments. So, firstly, retail super funds. So, retail are the likes of um, the BPs of the world um, and. Uh, who else would be a retailer? So, yeah, all the banks have them, West Pac and so forth. Um, they have about $540 million, so half a billion. 
and that's spread over about 13 million, 13 million members. Self-managed super funds are the potentially the biggest individual segment, 592 billion, uh, spread over 1.1 million members. Similarly, um, in, uh, public sector super, uh, which is 242 million. Now, what, what you'll notice a little bit different. Sorry, Pillion. What you'll notice is a little bit different here is that we've got assets and benefits. Now, benefits means that's what the liability is for the country, because ultimately that's our problem. That's what our liability is for the public sector, so public servants, uh, politicians, uh, and federal court judges. However, the assets that support that is only 242 billion. So there's a disparity there. Those of you who may remember the 2007 budget when John Howard and Peter Costello introduced this thing called the Future Fund. They threw, I think it was 100, 100, million, 100 billion aside for the future liabilities of the country. That's what that was for. And of course, subsequent governments have decided that we needed insulation in our roofs and school buildings, so it's been raided. So now that figure is a lot less, about 20 billion, I think. So, Ultimately, what that means is that if everyone that's, what is entitled to that entitlement retires today, we've got about 300 billion shortfall. We have to find for some reason. Industry super is 488 billion, spread over 11 million members. So what that means is we have, as I said, 2.2 trillion spread over 29 million members, which is ironic since we only actually have a population of 24 million. So, and the working population I think is about 12 or 13 million. So on average, we all have 2.2 member accounts inside so super, on average. Bearing in mind that if you have overseas workers who come in, they have to be paid as GC, so they've all got super accounts. They get, when they leave, they either don't realise they've got surplus and then they get stuck into the APO's coffers. So all that comes into it as well. <coughs> but some interesting, I suppose, observations of all this is that on average, we all have about $78,000 inside super. Thanks for that. self super fund, that average is two over half a million dollars. And even just for the normal, uh, and the public sector super, about 150,000. So there's some decent money kicking around inside the super environment. And historically, particularly around matrimonial matters, it's something that hasn't really been at the forefront in order to be Certainly going forward, it's going to become more and more prevalent. So the type of super that we've got, not all super is the same. So basically, we have these things called defined benefit funds. It has absolutely no bearing on how much money an individual has inside super center. It's all based on a formula. So these, this is actually how superannuation started. So back in the, the mid-1900s, we had big corporate entities, BHB, Telecom at the time, those sort of guys actually created their own super funds, corporate super funds. And they were defined benefits. For their executives. So it was all about way to keep handcuffs <coughs> on their on their execs. And it was all based on a all based on a formula. And essentially that formula gives you a highest average salary over the past three years. This is typically how it works. Highest average salary over the past three years, multiplied by how many years of service you have, multiplied by a formula or a vesting rate inside the deed itself. So they're all got all the different so typically those funds will actually tell you what your entitlement is today, in retirement, that sort of thing. Doesn't mean you can actually access it. So if you leave that employer, what you see on a member statement might not necessarily be what translates to your actual retirement dollars. So they're very different to what we're used to today. And following on from that, once again, the business of legacy with inside super. We have these things called complying pensions. And they can take different sort of forms. What complying means is that the section of legislation that says if they make these definitions, then they're complying for uh, uh, settlement purposes, which today doesn't really matter too much, but historically it did matter. And it also means that they can't be converted to a lump sum. There's some little 
nuances around that stuff. So for fixed term pensions, market limit, uh, sorry, fixed term lifetime and life expectancy pensions, they're typically the most common you'll see in a uh, industry or a public sector type environment. You can see them inside self-managed homes, but these days not too common. They're more about 2000, they stop about 2005. So if you have older clients, uh, then they tend to exist. Market link pensions sort of came and went in a relatively short period of time. So you may still see some of these around. And these are actually a little bit different in the fact that they're a complying pension. So the member can't convert them to a lump sum and sort of take the cash from away. However, they can be split as a lump sum for matrimonial purposes. So a little bit of a hybrid between the two. With defined benefit funds, this of defined benefit pensions, as they're sometimes called, or defined pensions, they're typically the ones where you do a payment splitting order, or a payment order, as opposed to a splitting order. So there are CFS is probably the most common as far as these type of pensions, the common circulation thing. And the member will receive a fixed amount and they'll split that to a non member or their spouse for fifty percent, whatever it may be. That's typically how those ones work. Then we have, I suppose, the more common, the defined benefit or accumulation funds. So really, probably since about 2000, these have certainly dominated the superannuation landscape. So these are more like a bank account. Money goes in, big contributions, that earns money, and then money comes out in the way of either tax or pension, lump sum, that sort of thing. So they're a very straightforward. What's on your, your bank statement? That's what you're entitled to. And then flowing on from that, we have our pensions that flow from those, which is account based, or they used to be called allocated pensions before 2007. Now there's a, a variant on that that's called the transition to retirement income stream. All that is is an account based pension with a bit more rules around it, meaning you can't take any more than 10% out. And that's all around the preservation age. So super is all about when you get older, when you retire. So preservation means that you can't access your super, essentially, unless you meet the certain, certain conditions. What um, John Howard and Peter Costello introduced in 2006-07 was this notion of a pension to help uh, members or older Australians transition to their retirement. So the intention was that you could give up two days a week and supplement that income the reality is that never actually happened and it was just used as a really good tax scheme for um, the members. And that's why there's now stopping that from 1 July this year. So from 1 July, transition to retirement pensions, yeah, they still exist, but they're not actually a pension under the new rules. And the earnings that those, those balances of that account earns will no longer be tax-free. So they become taxable just like accumulation. So an example, I've got about 100 funds that have transitioned to retirement pension selling, and I think I'll be stopping all but about 12 of them. So they're a, um, a fairly common strategy that people are using to maximise wealth, and they're taking that fun away from us. <coughs> so a little bit of a general overview about accessibility to super. So ultimately, we have conditions of release. As I mentioned, death, that's ultimately the, the preeminent condition of release, but you don't really get to use that very often, uh, and you don't really get the benefit for it. Temporary and permanent incapacity. So essentially, that's where a medical practitioner has certified, or sorry, two medical practitioners have certified that you're incapable of either returning to work permanently or uh, um, for a, a period of time to for the, uh, the work that you have suitable education skills and training for. So there's a bit of a, a, a tight definition around that. So two medical practitioners certify that, then you can access super. Retirement. Now that may seem a fairly straightforward concept, but I'll go into that in a minute. It's not quite as simple as you may think. Severe financial hardship, 
Um, this is a very limited circumstances. So basically that's where uh, the member has to prove that the bank is literally about to foreclose on them. And they have to be on Centrelink benefits for 26 weeks, continuous weeks, certain criteria. And you're only allowed up to $10,000 on that. And you have to apply to APRA, which is the government body that looks after the, the bigger super funds, as well as the bank. <clears throat> terminal medical condition, essentially once again, two medical practitioners to certify that yeah, this person is going to die in the next few years uh, means we can access your super. And compassionate grounds, highly, highly unlikely that anyone will access up this group because it's too hard. Um, to give you a quick oversight, we have this thing called the superannuation complaint tribunal. And of all cases they hear revolve around the payouts of insurance uh, and the balances all essentially made up about the definitions between incapacity and compassionate risk. So it's, there's a lot of grey, particularly when you're dealing with big trustees, you know, the perpetuals of the world and, and so forth, they're going to typically be very conservative in their approaches because they don't want to get this. I don't want to have to go through the ACC and that's why the SEC doesn't have all those diamonds to go with that. So, retirement, the solving notion of retirement. Now, there's actually three stages to retirement. Under eight, so from preservation age to 59. Now, preservation age depends on when you're born. So, if you're born before 1960, 1 July 1960, your preservation age is 55. But then we have a transitional phase where that scales up to 60. So if you're born in 19, so if you're born the 30th of June 1962, your preservation age will actually be 57. So it's all, all this is like the smooth scale that rolls through. Now, <clears throat> between the age of preservation age and 59, you have to retire with a due payment. So basically you've got to say, I will not be gainfully employed for more than 10 hours a week going forward. Between 60 and 64, we have this lovely grey area that, that comes in. People like me love grey. What it basically means is you just have to retire from a gainful employment arrangement. So if your client has two jobs, they can stop working in just one of those jobs, and that's good enough to access your system. And then 65, everything becomes what's called unrestricted non preserved That means it's all Now the reason why I'm supposed to be going through this is that I've seen many orders that will say when the, when the, the member, uh, the husband, reaches 60, then the wife will get a certain entitlement. But that doesn't always work. Because what if the husband has actually met the condition of release to allow them to access the money? I've seen one of those orders that relates to super to a self managed fund. Now, in that particular instance, the whole fund was an absolute basket case. There were compliance issues that were buried all the way down through a structure that ultimately meant that the husband, if he really wanted to, could have made him a self person bankrupt and would have eliminated her entire member balance of that amount of So those type of orders I never think it So relying on a something to occur in the future, like a condition of release, I think it's really dangerous. You're better off essentially doing a splitting order then and there. And even flagging orders, particularly around self-managed funds, don't don't work. Because ultimately the trust will not be on this side. Now as you may be aware, we have a little tsunami coming in for super changes. These are the biggest changes we've had inside super in about 10 years, since 2006. And there's a number of implications that relate to matrimonial matters. But before I get to that, I'll sort of give you a little bit of backstory about what, it, what, what those changes are and then what it means, sorry, to what's the so basically, 
Basically, that's what my brain's like at the moment, going through um, all these. So these, this legislation was introduced in November last year, and essentially it all comes into effect. Not that I'm so we have this new notion of a transfer balance cap. And you've probably all heard about this $1.6 million cap. But as with most things, the devil's in the detail, it's not quite that straightforward. So, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about what that transfer balance cap, how it's actually made up. We also have this thing called the transfer balance account. Now the transfer balance account, so the cap is actually your individual threshold. So we have a general transfer balance cap, that is what is the rules, and then all of us from 1 July will have a personal transfer balance cap. So if you're not on a pension, your transfer balance cap, funnily enough, is 1.6 million, like the general. If you start a pension, then you've got something different going on. So I'll put some examples to explore what that looks like. And then, of course, because we have these defined benefit pensions that can't be converted to a lump sum, we have things called special balances. And that's all based on a formula. Typically, that formula will be the annual pension that the member receives multiplied by 16, but not always. So for what's called lifetime pensions, that's what it is, by 16, where you have life expectancy, fixed term, market linked pensions, it's up to the It's all that you need to actually understand the pension itself to see how long it has to run, and you multiply by that. So really, it's not about you guys knowing how to do the count. It's all about being aware that what's in front of you is a capital gains tax relief. Now, you guys, I think this is a real sleeper, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And contributions restrictions. So from 1 July, members that have more than 1.6 million in super cannot actually add what's called non-concessional contributions to super from that. Now, that may or may not really be relevant, but it all comes back to the restructuring orders or the client has the intention to receive a whole heap of cash personally, then put it back into super then that might pull them out of that. So once again, it's something to be wary of or be mindful of. <coughs> so transfer balance accounts. What makes them up? Basically a pre existing pension, so a pension that's that's going from one July two thousand and seven. I'll tell you again, two thousand and seven. Any new pensions that have started? are added to this transfer balance account. Any reversionary pension, so that's basically where we have a husband and wife, husband dies, and the super gets transferred to the spouse. And notional earnings that accrue because you because the member has too much money inside super and there's a big bit of a penalty. So that's a credit. So that basically means what's added to your the transfer balance. So it's taken away from the transfer balance account. So this is almost bringing in double entry accounting to the pension transfer. So pension, what's called a complication. So that's when a pension is basically stopped or partially stopped. As I mentioned, truth is aren't actually a pension going forward. There's also relief in there for family laws and excluding orders. Relief for fraud in certain circumstances and structured settlement. So that's where there's an insurance claim. Um, because of um, personal injury or the like. <coughs> now, basically, the way that you determine someone's transfer balance account is firstly you have to look at all of their super. You need to know their total superannuation balance. So you can no longer just looking super funds in isolation. Everything has to be looked at in totality. So the first place you start is your special balance pension. So you define benefit type of arrangement. What's that value? What's the capital value? You've got a client that receives $94,000 a year as part of their pension, plus a pension.
function from a confined sum that essentially equates to just under 1.69 Now they also have an allocated pension on account based pension somewhere else that's worth about 200,000. So between those two we're over, we're over the threshold. So we can just look at one fund and we'll apply it together. <coughs> We add to that their other super. So remember, we're only worrying about this if they're in pension phase or about to go into pension phase. And you may think that you know, most people don't get divorced in that situation. Um, I've had a couple of 82 and 84 last year with, with divorce. Um, I've worked uh, at the moment on uh, 67 and 72. Yeah. So it does happen. So all these sort of considerations that come into it. And then we take off any excess. So that's basically if you know, that gives us 1.4 million, we've got 300 here, that means we have 100,000 excess. So we have to take that off. Because ultimately, we don't want any more than 1.6 million. If we do, there are tax consequences of that. So I'll run through a couple of examples to try and explain what I'm going on about here. So say that we've got um, Alison who's married to Shane. She has a pension going for $1.2 million. Shane's got a million dollars in pension also. They separate in 2020 and they want to split their split of 50 50 Quite straightforward. Alison's pension balance is now $1.4 million. Though. So she started 1.2, it's increased to 1.4. Shane's only gone up to 1.1. Now, down here you'll note I've assumed that there's no transfer balance cap indexation. So the transfer balance cap, it starts at 1.6, it increases in $100,000 increment based on CPI. So it's probably going to be about three, four years before we see an increase, but we don't really know. So I'm just working off 1.6 based on years. So what that means is that Alison has a credit of $1.2 million, starting her pension. Then we have the super split. Now remember, it was worth $1.4 million, this splitting 50-50. So we have a $700,000 debit coming away. So now, her transfer balance cap is half a million dollars, because it's $1.2 with hundred. However, her actual balance on her member statement will be $700,000. So now we're actually running two member accounts for every single member in some two. As for Shane, he had his million dollars. Now you notice he's only got a six hundred thousand dollar credit, even though he's getting seven hundred. Because that would mean that he would be over his one point six. So we've given him a six hundred thousand dollar credit. So his transfer balance account is 1.6, but his actual balance is 1.8. The other 200 sits in accumulation phase. So now he has a pension account of 1.6, and he has an accumulation account of 200,000. So we have two things going on. So you can have more than 1.6 million in super, but you can only have 1.6 million in pension phase. Without tax. Without tax. Now, as far as a payment split goes, it gets really confusing. So let's say that we've got, as of 1 July 17, Justin receives 400,000, oh, sorry, 400,000, 4,000 a month pension. 400,000 a month. The special value of that being 1.6 million. Right? So that's based on the formula. It comes back to his wife Lizzie leaves him in November 2007 and they get court orders to say that she gets 60% of the pension in April 2018. So the special in April, whoops, in April 18, the special value of this pension is increased because we're in a new financial year, it's all based on that pension amount, so now it's 1.61 million. That's a 
increases above the 1.6 centimeter, that's fine. It's all about the starting point of the critical part. Lizzie currently has nothing in super or no transfer balance account. So how does that look? So we've got Justin's 1.7, uh, sorry, his pension that's worth 1.6. So we've got the four hundred, uh, sorry, the four thousand dollars a month, which equals one point six. So that's what that is there. Then we have the payment split. So this here is sixty percent of the new value in April two thousand eighteen of one point six one. Okay, okay. So the next bit will blow your mind. How that actually works <coughs> is that now we have whoops. We now have a debit and credit situation for Lizzie. So she actually gets also, because it's a payment split, she gets a credit for the new value in its totality. The entire amount. So that should be one uh, one point six one million there. So she gets a credit for that whole amount. But then she gets a debit for the forty percent she's not receiving. So that means that her transfer balance account ends up with 966000 which is 6% of the original, so that's a 1.61. Why do I do that? I can be explaining it inside your mind. Quite simple. It's all about manipulating the system to the government's benefit. What we've, the way it works really is Oh, that's all this is about. Um, the $1.6 million, I mentioned before how we had a general transfer balance cap that increased in $100,000 increments based on CPI. Now, if, you're, if you hit $1.6 million, or if you have any sort of pension going, you don't actually get the full benefit of $100,000 offset. You get a percentage of it. So let's say you start a pension at $800,000. The half one point six. When the hundred thousand, when the general transfer balance cap increases by hundred, you only get fifty thousand of that. Right? So you get a proportion. If you start a pension on one point six million, you'll never get an increase in your transfer balance cap. So by doing this, this you will never get an increase in your transfer balance cap. So if she has other money outside of super, then she can never put it into pension funds. Oh, sorry, she can, but she'll never get an increase above 1.6 million. So it's all about the government essentially gaining the system. Very clever. I'll give them that. So once again, there's a lot of a lot of technical stuff going on with all this. It's not the sort of thing that you have to know about being aware of it. Particularly from 1 July, and let's face it, that's only around the corner, all the orders that you will do going forward, you'll have to have this sort of notion in front of mind relating to super. So there's much. Right. I'm going to have a break and the thing just important. Okay, all right. Um, you can see, um, yeah, my name is Ben Gordon. I, I do family law valuation here at Vincent, and as part of that, um, I do the um, superannuation defined benefit valuation. So what we thought we'd um, slide in here is is a, is, a, is a couple of slides worth of that. Um, in, in talking about defined benefit valuations, um, Brett touched on them um, briefly. I'm, I'm really just focusing on that bit um, where so people's benefits are based on a multiple of the highest average salary that they get. Um, have people dealt with defined benefits for family law? So I think it's most would have some exposure to it. And, and this isn't going to be a technical thing really so much at all, but it's really a bit, I guess, I'm just trying to draw out a few things that we've seen over the last few years about how these things are attacked in practice. And, and I guess some of our feedback on that and um, some of the issues that we've seen come up. So. 
So it's meant to be, um, yeah, not overly technical. And it's not also lawyer bashing or anything like that, but it's just some of the um, some of the things we see arising. So, look, one thing I think that stands out, and this might sound obvious, but if you do get in, if someone brings to you, one of your clients, that you've got to just, um, they've got a defined benefit there, it's probably better to, to deal with trying to get that SIS form and get it valued sooner than later. Um, I find that you, you see ones where people sort of do ring occasionally and they're going, oh, you know, should we, do we need to get this valued? We've got a mediation in two days and that. And I've got to be honest, when people go and so they send off the SIS form, it's not really easy to get the super fund themselves to, um, they're not really receptive to speeding up the process, we found, like it's, it will take a bit of time um, in terms of getting those forms out. And likewise, um, if there are any issues with those valuations, like I find, like if you, you know, some of them may change their, their responses to you, the, the super funds, and they're giving you the defined benefit information. If you raise a query with that, they can take quite a while to, to respond. So my advice would tend to be to get a value, um, you know, get that valuation process going um, if you're getting a valuation to find benefit. And the other thing I guess is too is that sometimes people go, oh, can you do a valuation based on this estimate? I'll show you the, the husband or the wife's super account. And you, quite often you, you can, but that's not a great thing either because the way the super fund regulations work, there's a very specific answer to what a valuation of a, of a defined benefit is. So doing an estimate, if you do that, you probably are going to be wrong. You don't want to have to revisit it. Um, just as a, um, another thing here is probably the, the, the ones we see in practice probably are the, the, the three big areas are the Commonwealth FIFA, the public sector super scheme, and the defence related defined benefits. I don't know if people see many outside that, um, but they tend to be the leading forms of defined benefits. There's some practitioners out there that seem to get a lot of defence and that if they're located near defence bases and things like that. Um, we don't see a lot of other stuff these days, but they've all closed off. And there's a few like Qantas, and I think there's um, some of the and some university schemes and all of that. But mostly, the defined benefits are, are closing off, and it's those three that are the big ones. Um, one of the other things about getting a superannuation valuation done sooner than later is, um, is I find it's amazing how much some of these superannuation accounts can be worth, and um, and also, I know for me, I'm not too bad with numbers, but when you get those figures in, it's very hard until you run the numbers to know what size the pension is. And I know we've done one where we've done a few where we've done one evaluation of a super fund like two days before a mediation. And, you know, you send off a super valuation thing at that point saying that the pension or their, their defined benefit is worth a million dollars. And you, and you sort of wonder, you know, like how's that, how much of a shock that might be to that mediation because it's because they really can be worth quite a lot of money. And it is a pretty cheap, I mean, it's only a few hundred dollars for a superannuation valuation, so it's not a big process. But I think sometimes, I often wonder, thinking, gosh, you know, this is going to be a bit of a problem because if, you know, you've got the million dollar house and all of a sudden you've got a million dollar super on one side, that can be something to deal with. And I, I guess, we'll, you know, as an example, we've seen some recent ones. We've had a 58-year-old on a $20,000 pension. Um, defence pension, and that was worth 300000 We had a 63-year-old on a $23,000 pension that was worth 300000 And recently, a public sector for a 51-year-old who was getting 50000 a year, that up at 900000 So you can get some pretty, um, and we've seen, we've seen pensions valued up at $1.5 million. So they can be quite, um, they can be quite substantial amounts. So it's worth getting a sense on that um, as early as you can. I'm still finding, I don't know if anyone here has had any country experience, but there's, there's not, in terms of the defined benefit stuff, the funds aren't doing it much themselves. But Chief Super, I think, still does. But um, by and large, um, the funds aren't providing their own valuation. So um, just bear that in mind if you get your SIP form in that you will need to do something with it. Some of them, a lot of the forms aren't really all that well set out. And we often do get questions from people asking us for valuation. They send us the form and asking us, if we can tell them if evaluation is actually included on that form. So just be, um, whenever you get a SIP form, make sure you've got a reasonable understanding of it because it, um, they, the, the, the funds themselves, I don't feel, always try to be overly helpful. It's, it's, it's a bit of a pain in the neck for them. Um, 
And I guess, look, another thing that's, I, I think this probably follows a lot of property settlements, but particularly in the defined benefits that we see is um, there's a real lack, a, a, a lack of keenness to, to ever split these defined benefit funds. They are a lot of hassle and all of that sort of thing. And I imagine probably generally when you're talking about any sort splitting, um, people like to avoid that, but um, it's particularly so with the defined benefits. And um, it's also quite messy anyway because there's all the different deeds and everything governing that. So just a few more um, points there as well. Um, look, I think you may or may not deal with some of this area, but I think it's probably fair to say defence boards, pensions, are, are the toughest, are probably one of the trickiest areas. I don't know if you've dealt much with that. Um, they can value up pretty, um, pretty substantially because often people have retired from the defence boards for whatever reason quite young and um, can get quite decent um, pensions and that. And so there's one, I think, in our experience, one of the really big problems with it is, is that regardless of even the technical form of a defence force pension, for many occasions, it's um, the recipient of that pension, it's, it's in, a, in a sense, it's almost like a personal injury compensation sort of payment. And it's quite an ugly idea um, for, I think, in some of them to find out that there's 80 grand they're getting a year. Um, which may not be called a, um, if in the nature of a conversation, settlement that that's worth, you know, a, a million or two, when all they're really seeing is that that's what's, you know, compensating them for not being able to work. And I don't ever envy the, the lawyers who have to have that conversation with their client when they're saying, the spouse is telling them, you can keep your pension and I'll take the house and that sort of thing. Um, so I think the defence force um, stuff is quite um, tricky. Um, a growing area we're seeing a little bit more action in, is in the foreign pensions. Um, and I think you see that a bit in the UK side, because we're getting more um, people coming over um, from the United Kingdom in recent years and all of that. Um, it's a bit of a growing growing issue. I think what I have to say with that, whenever we've dealt with foreign pensions, one of the really big issues with that is just information. It's not necessarily that difficult to do a foreign a value of foreign pension. You can use the default regulations and things like that. But it's that problem of like people, if it's the other spouse that has the information, um, it can be really difficult to get it from them. And you don't really have that ability to understand to, to request information from a foreign super fund if it's not you're not the member and that sort of thing. And I find often also um, the people who are receiving the pension don't tend to understand what's going on with it anyway. Like they don't just this magical amount and and also what you get in something like say there's quite a few like tooth and drab sort of pensions out there um say in the uk like there's the um the government if you work there for a certain amount of years you pay national insurance you can get this pension for life but we had one the other day i think it was two thousand pounds a year and all of that and it's kind of hard to get a lot of info around them but the good news is that they're often not worth enormous amounts but they can be valued and all of that so it's always worth um you know, we, we probably tend to use um, the default super regulations or you can use an annuity style calculation and that sort of thing. But any of those sort of pensions, it's always worth having a bit of a look into to, um, to see what, what they're about. But again, though, we have someone who had a United Nations pension and it was just a complete, you know, they were based in like uh, somewhere in Europe and the pension was being paid out of France and, this was, and it was just, you know, they really didn't have any documentation or anything. And so you know, it can be pretty tricky. So the information stuff is a big thing. But, but I think you'll see a bit more. One, one thing just actually on the UK is that they do have a facility there. Collect, uh, um, I can't quite remember, the, the CEB, the, um, there's a calculated value that you can, people are able to request of their super fund. I think on an annual basis, you can get a value of your pension. Um, it's, it's called a CEB. And um, it's a collective estimated value or something like that. And so people are able to get that, but I understand, I think it's like, it can take up to three or four months um, to get one of those sort of um, valuations if you're, if you're doing it over there. So that's one thing just to keep in mind, but again, that's probably a bit of a, an advanced thing. It doesn't help you if it's the day before a mediation. Um, one thing just look, that is floating out there, some of you may have come across, is the Campbell case that came out in July last year where there was an interesting judgment um, which held that a defence force invalidity pension, which is 
covered by the supervaluation regulation. It held that that was a superannuation interest, but it wasn't technically a defined benefit interest. So in theory, it was actually an accumulation interest. And look, I'm, I'm not sure anyone quite knows what that really means or the practical effect of that. I have to say that we've, we've had a couple that have had since then, um, in the Supreme Court, and that hasn't changed the information or the nature the nature of the information being provided by defence. And we actually, um, because there was potential for it to apply to that sort of pension for a, a CSS and, um, scheme, we actually had a, a CSS invalidity pension come up and, and we contacted the CSS and they, um, after some period of time, came back and said that there was no, that decision didn't affect CSS or PSS pensions at all. Um, and so they just gave us the regular information. So I don't know where that case is, whether that's going to be appealed or it's under appeal or anything like that at the moment, or, or even what, I don't know if anyone quite knows what it means, but from a practical point of view, we haven't seen any change in the information being provided for defined benefit information as a result of that case at the moment. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens with that, but um, for our point of view, it hasn't changed anything at this point. A couple of last um, points there too. But just the devil is a bit in the detail, um, and it's probably a, it's probably more in, in breadth area. In this, but just be a, it, with, when you are dealing with the defined benefits, it is a bit of a case of going back to the deed and the individual piece of funds about how you can do various things, and um, and it can be. Like, I know that there was one we had recently for one of the. I can never quite remember which funds it was. There's quite a few around, but. Where someone had got a pension and they'd, you know, we'll say, five hundred dollars a week, and they they'd agreed that they split it five hundred, two hundred and fifty dollars each. But what actually, and there was we valued it up at then, you know, the capital value of the pension was five hundred grand. So the orders they sought were two hundred fifty dollars in pension each. But what actually happened was that that wasn't valid under the super fund D, and that what they actually had to do was they go, well, the capital value is five hundred thousand. You've got to give 50 percent of the capital value to each party, and then you recalculate the pension based on that 250,000. And the reason for that was because you know, the person who was getting the pension, I think, was 60, sorry, 65, and the person who was getting the split was 60. So the person who was 60 had a longer life expectancy and all of that. So they actually got the, they actually got a lesser pension payment because they were going to have to last longer. Because obviously, what worries Super funds is if you capitalise a pension up at 300 grand and say someone is 75 and then they have a younger spouse who's 50. Um, if someone gets a cap uh, that same pension at the age of 50 or that equivalent, they're going to get paid. The super funds now got to pay that to them for 30, 40 years. So it's just always go back to that when it when it comes to talking turkey on the splitting, um, there is the detail and I think the, the difficulties of some of that stuff is why. There's an encouragement for people to keep to hold on to their own part of the super pie. Um, and look, the other thing is just the last one. Um, you know, people have different exposures and different experiences and stuff. And there's there's a lot of things that may seem obvious with super splitting, but sort of you can come undone a bit um, and all of that. So it's probably worth asking. Like we're happy to give a quick call if you've got a quick query on super. It's often worth. Um, just asking a quick question um, because you, people can be quite misinformed. Like I know that we've um, we have had been contacted where someone's rung up and said, "Oh, we've got this form. Um, I've heard that you, you're supposed to get, you know, defined benefits value and all of that. Is that true?" And stuff because people don't necessarily have a lot of exposure to it. Um, and I think that sort of the fact that they had to get that value was quite a surprise to them. And it's even just, and I, and I, I guess there's just different levels of detail and. and it, I think one of the simple things too is just to find benefits. There, there, I have seen the misconception that if it's in the accumulation phase, you just use the kind of the current balance of the defined benefit um, as the value, whereas in fact that actually has to go to a formula and um, be discounted back to a current, um, get discounted back as a, as a value. So it's just it's one of those things that there's quite a there's quite a few aspects I think of the super splitting that seem quite but then when you look into it a bit more, they're a bit messy and all of that sort of thing. But anyway, so that, were just, um, that was probably all I was just looking to, to point out. But I, I guess, look, if you just keep some of those things in mind, you might find them useful and you come across these things.
And moving on to something far more interesting, um, now I won't go over a lot around this because most of you will probably wear what's involved. But look, essentially, with the self-managed super funds, the important thing is that you read the deed. Um, structure is really important. Um, understand the member accounts inside the self-managed fund. It may not be as obvious or straightforward as you as it seems. Make sure that the members are the trustees and the trustees are the members. That's usually the case, but not always. There may be enduring powers of attorney in place and things like that. Um, and also, as I've hanged on before, remember to consider uh, the transfer balance accounts, transfer balance caps, that sort of thing. So your financial won't necessarily show you any of that information. You'll be in the background somewhere. Um, your lawyers may need to read the deed, but you'll be surprised how many times that I get involved in a matrimonial matter. The self-managed fund has a trustee that is going back to before splitting came in 2003 or four that doesn't allow for splitting. Three million dollar fund, and I got involved right at the tail end, and yet the deed didn't allow for splitting. So it's it's an obvious thing, but something that is often um, so the trustee will tell you, there's no one to do, obviously limitations, look for those splitting clauses, that sort of thing, um, depending on members' age, if they can receive uh, the, their benefit at the lump sum. Um, and obviously the documentation around the fund, that the pensions in place, uh, see the pension documentation, so you can actually determine the type of pension. The self-managed super fund can have any type of pension is so So things to look out for as far as the valuation viewpoint goes. Uh, basically, the assets have to be valued at market value each year. Now typically with property, that will happen every three years. For a splitting order, commencement of pension, sorry, commencement of pensions, the valuation has to be obtained before those things happen. So, there's property involved, has to be valued. Look for losses or this lovely deferred capital gains tax that's coming in as part of these new regimes. So as part of the, the new changes coming through, we can actually elect to realise the capital gains tax position inside a super fund. And I'll pay that tax now, we can pay it at a later point in time. So if you have a situation where you've got a self-managed fund they have elected to do this in, in the 2017 tax return. In 2019, if they separate, if they then decide that they want to transfer in fee one asset from a self-managed fund to another self-managed fund, that transaction is no capital gains tax on. Beautiful. However, we've got a liability sitting there that relates from 2007 that is payable by the original super fund on disposal. So we're crystallising a capital gains tax position essentially by doing that. So that's just something else to be mindful of. That needs to come into the valuation. Be mindful of asset segregation. So if um, it is possible to segregate assets so they have a hidden pair assets potentially inside the self-managed fund, depending on their value. Look for accrual accounting, tax effective accounting, all these things affect the valuation. So what you see on the financial statements might, or the member statements might not actually be depending on what you're doing as far as tax goes. And finally, reserving. So reserving is basically where the fund earns money but doesn't give it to all the members. So that's going to be a strategy that may be supported a bit more frequently going forward. All the, the big super funds do it, some self managed funds do it as well. So once again, something to be aware of. It's part of the assets, but not part of the members that um, benefit. Capital gains tax, self-managed funds pay capital gains tax. So all assets are CGC applicable. Um, however, if the fund is supporting a pension, there may not actually be any tax payable. There may be the next. So just be mindful of that. And 
as far as in a matrimonial splitting arrangement goes, if the self-managed fund is selling an asset as part of the the, 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 the splitting orders or the, the report orders, then capital gains tax will apply. If they're transferring an asset to another self-managed fund, then it won't. But if they transfer, then the original cost base will follow. So it's not really a clearing or eliminating of the capital gains tax includes the clearing of the later point in time. And so as part of the CDT provisions, so relationship breakdowns, so it's an, it's an automatic essentially CDT relief that applies. So long as there are court orders, superannuation agreements, or binding financial agreement in place, then that applies. Same with stamp duty exemption, as I'm sure you're all well aware. Um, now that's only, as I said, the in species transfers between self-managed funds. If it goes from a self-managed fund out to an individual, then you don't get that capital gains tax if you have a leak. However, depending on the member's age, you can potentially structure it so they do receive it. So I've got a client who's 72, he's taking an asset out of the super fund as part of his matrimonial uh, matter, and he's going to get that capital gains tax free because they're both intention So, no difference. So, yeah, it's just the rollover of the capital gains tax, from the um, exemption from it, and the acquisition date is basically the deems, so when the transfer occurs. Uh, and the cost base is the original cost base. And as I mentioned, CGT relief, be mindful of that because if you transfer an asset from one super fund to another, then the first super fund actually has to pay that tax then and then. So realising that capital gains tax is easy. Exactly. So if you Basically, the member entitlement seems to be reduced to allow for that. Because it, it, it'll happen in, if it happens in the 2018 year, mm -hmm. then the tax is payable then. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that, to be honest, is a real sleeper. Mm -hmm. um, that if they make an election, there may be a tax liability that's sitting there that has to be paid. Now, that should be on the balance sheet. However, the election you make from a self managed super fund point of view happens in one of the schedules of the tax return. So that's where you tell the tax office what you're doing. That's the fact. It should be on the balance sheet, but the recount will be a little bit different. And just quickly, I'm going to have to go to some notes here. So uh, a little bit of a very brief case study. Very brief, given our time. So we've got the Storm family, husband, wife, two kids. And they had you know, various assets uh, for themselves. So they have family home, um, they've got a small business operating in there in the trust. Um, they've got some um, profits in the company, rental properties and self-managed fund. A self-managed fund has a uh, has a, a couple of different assets in there. So it has commercial property, residential property, and other pieces. Now Basically, what they've decided to do is the husband just wants to keep his balance inside the fund, so there's no splitting order in this particular example. Uh, but the wife wants to get the cash and property. Right, that's all fine. We can, we can achieve all that. So the thing to, I suppose, really bear in mind is that there can be other opportunities that sort of flesh out as part of this process. So basically, even though the husband is getting essentially just a, a balance, so his first thing is just in the cash or shares, there's got a commercial property sitting outside of super. So it may be an opportunity if we need cash as part of the overall matrimonial process to move the commercial property inside the self-managed fund to then have that cash go out. So they're buying the commercial property. Super fund is buying the commercial property or the property in the first place. It's the way that you can get cash in the matrimonial pool if you need it. Ages make a difference. So rather than transferring assets 
from one set of funds to another, and they then entitled to receive it personally as an in-species transfer, benefit payment. So all that can come into it as well. So just because it's inside super doesn't mean it has to stay inside super. Just because it's outside doesn't mean it has to stay outside. Um, and what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, so using super for the um, liquidity, and that sort of thing. So it's, it sort of starts to move beyond the orders. It's more about moving, you know, trying to provide options to find a different scenario that they could consider to achieve ultimately what they want to achieve. So on cash outside and we've got assets outside we can move in, and that's possible, depending on the asset. So it was really just more about flagging Um, now, and obviously things like um, you know, the tax consequences um, to consider the uh, if they've got corporate trustees in place, the, the office holders and shareholders of the, the trusted company and all that sort of thing. Typically all of the structures so that's the all things necessary to protect transfers of shareholdings and, and the like and directorships.